Wonderful pleasure to be able to talk to you about the challenges in the housing space. I want to give you a bit of a broad overview of what the government is attempting to achieve and why it's important. Uh, give you a bit of an idea about where the reform program's up to and a bit of a steer as to plans for next year. Firstly, uh, why does it matter? Well, if you read the OECD reports, the Reserve Bank and the Treasury about the state of the economic recovery, it's actually pretty optimistic for New Zealand. We're in pretty good shape. But the biggest risk that they've identified to New Zealand's economic recovery is what's going on in this housing space. And particularly the high risk around house price inflation in markets like Auckland, but not exclusively Auckland. And the reason it's such a challenge for the government is that normally what happens at this point of the economic cycle is the Reserve Bank Governor will grab that interest rates lever and give it a pull and quieten it down. And the danger for New Zealand is that because our economy is significantly ahead of the pack in the OECD around that economic cycle, if he does that, you're going to get a huge inflow of capital into New Zealand. Investors all around the world want a nice, safe place that's got high interest rates. That will drive the dollar up and that will stuff up the government's broader economic plan, which is actually to try and grow the productive and the exporting base of the economy. And that is effectively why the Reserve Bank governor has gone down this new tool of those LVR limits to try and uh, pop that house price bubble and get a greater degree of stability uh, into house prices. So firstly, the argument around housing matters enormously to the broader story of what the government is so hoping to achieve around economic recovery. But it's also really important in a social policy sense. You read any of the data about how New Zealand's getting along, if you have children growing up in crowded, cold, mouldy homes, they end up in our hospitals incurring diseases, rheumatic fever and all those things. We also know that in terms of educational achievement, if kids are in overcrowded homes, that their educational achievement's not as good as well. So it's actually pretty important from a social policy perspective. And excuse me, I'm a bit of a greenie at heart. And uh, the third dimension of which housing is pretty important is as we try and deal with some of the environmental challenges for New Zealand, uh, some of the stuff that we do in the building and development is pretty important to improving New Zealand's environmental performance. So I just give you that as a broad picture of, of, of why it matters. I also have to make plain uh, that I am a absolute advocate for growing home ownership. Why? Uh, is because when people own their home, they have not only the financial security that goes with that, but they are so much better connected with their community. Interesting looking at the participation rates in local body elections. If you own your own house, you're twice as likely to participate and vote in your local elections. Why? Because you're writing that damn rates check. You've got a pretty big interest in who you might elect to City Hall and, in my view, is a pretty important part of the social fabric of what makes New Zealand tick. One of my old political heroes was a guy, Sir Keith Holyoke, and one of his lovely sayings that I really enjoyed was, a capitalist society is great as long as everybody gets to be a capitalist. And for most New Zealanders, actually their home is their stake and their block of capital. So that's my first point. That's why it matters. Now, in terms of the government's program, home ownership rates have been in decline pretty consistently since 1987. We were top of the pack in the OECD, been declining for about 25 years. Biggest single factor that actually affects, if you look over the long haul, not just in New Zealand history but internationally, the single biggest factor that affects your level of home ownership is your interest rates. If you take the interest rates that were high, and I can still remember the day, when I got the letter from the bank to say my home interest rate was going up to 24% in a slightly ugly period during the 1980s. Uh, if you look at those periods when those interest rates are high, you really do see a dip, not just in New Zealand but internationally, in the capacity for people to be able to get into their homes. In that regard, the government feels we're in pretty good shape. Lowest interest rates in about 50 years. But it's the other parts where we've got some big work to do. Now, if you want to know what's my gospel, what's the plan, read the Productivity Commission report. In my view, that report that was published in 2012 is a really good analysis, robust piece of work around what are the things that New Zealand needs to do to get a better ratio of incomes to house price 
and to be able to improve the overall affordability of housing. And it identified five key areas that the government is working on. The first and the most important is the question of land supply. There's been some pretty poor quality public policy decision making around land supply that means that over the last couple of decades, the proportion of the consumer's house price, that is the land price, has grown far more quickly than any other. And if you want to make the comparison with our trans-Tasman cousins, it's the difference in the section price that is bigger than any other component of it. And that is why at the top of my agenda has been addressing those issues. If you want the short version of what's gone wrong, two parts. The first is that at a high level, bodies like the old Auckland Regional Council said we don't like urban sprawl, we're going to put a very tight metropolitan urban limit around Auckland and intensification will happen. In reality, the moment there were proposals for densification, the territorial councils that at that point were separate were singing a different tune and weren't interested in facilitating it. And the second thing is, and it's happened in my own community in Nelson, Auckland's not unique, is that when you go down to the leafy suburbs and streets and you say that you're going to free up the rules and allow people to put a lot denser housing in, all bloody hell breaks loose. Politicians like to get elected and they buckle. And that has been the symptomatic story of attempts to try and get intensification. And in the Auckland scenario, we've ended up with the worst of both worlds, no intensification, insufficient new greenfields, section price goes through the roof, and if you want to see the worst example of it, hop down into Flatbush, have a look at that parcel of land that was purchased on the public record for about $890,000 that's currently on the market for $115 million and wish that you were there and you'd bought it. But that is the symptom of failed land supply policy and the loser of that massive capital gain in land that happens to be luckily within the MUL is that that comes at the enormous cost of that Kiwi family that's lining up and wanting to get into that step of home ownership. And then there's a second part of that story around the sort of dis dislocation of how our land use policies are working. You've all been at the front line of this. In a period of five years, you've sort of gone from boom housing market 2007 to bottom of the trough in 2011 and boom again and starting to really get some momentum back quickly again. Problem, and this is very clearly identified in the OECD report and re-emphasised in our Productivity Commission report, is that our Resource Management Act systems, what well, it takes an average of between five and seven years to get a plan change. Yet you've got the economic cycle bouncing around at a period or two, three years. And so there just isn't the responsiveness in our local government and resource management systems to be able to free up the land and move as the market moves, and as a consequence, uh, we get some pretty big distortions. So the uh, Housing Accord and Special Housing Area legislation is the government saying, hey, look, in a number of areas of New Zealand, number one, Auckland, we have to be able to get far more nimble-footed around those land supply questions, and we've got a very positive accord with the Auckland Council of which progress is being made about going at fast track and getting new areas of land uh, available for subdivision and simultaneously providing some new tools to be able to do intensification without every man and his dog holding it up forever. Uh, the next step on that program is the government's number one priority was the Auckland housing market, but it's not the only market where there are tensions. And in the next couple of weeks I'll be making some announcements about work that we're doing with councils in other parts of the country, similar to the Auckland Accord, where there are those same sorts of pressures. So the first really important message is from the government's perspective, the single biggest question for us is around land supply. Now if we go again back to the Productivity Commission report, what's the second biggest candidate? that's driven up the costs of housing? Answer, development contributions and, and costs of infrastructure, a biggie. So uh, we know from the records that those costs have trebled over the period of the last 10 years. In fact, if you look across all the items, which one's gone up the most in that Productivity Commission report, it's the development contribution. Why? Well, the government's pretty pragmatic and being a player of the dark arc of politics for probably too long, uh, is that the political dynamic that goes on around councils, not Auckland or anybody, I don't blame them, I'm just saying what happens, uh, is that you're the local councillor, 
and you've got a big bill for some costs, and you've got a choice about where you put that cost. And you go, um, do I put it on rates? Oh, hang on. There's a hell of a lot of rate payers out there voting. Or do I whack it on the developer? And the political tensions is very much to put as much cost as you can in the development pot. Of course, the developer actually doesn't pay it. They simply add it onto the price of the section, and that's being paid by the new homeowner. At fault, in my view, is the 2002 Local Government Act that was heralded through Parliament by then Minister of Local Government, Sandra Lee. She's on the record in Parliament saying she didn't care how high the development contributions went up because they just go out of the profits of those rich developers. Actually, she's wrong. It's come out of the pockets of those homeowners, and we've got to change it. Uh, so we'll be introducing a bill before Christmas that makes significant changes to the way in which councils uh, are able to charge for those development contributions. The first change is to narrow the purpose uh, of what legally can be charged for. It should charge, rightly, for the core infrastructure that is provided to service sections, uh, but uh, it does and should not go into the the art gallery and the broader nice-to-haves, uh, that is for all ratepayers and communities to pay for. And the other bit that we need to do with it is we need to have a neutral arbitrator. Let's be honest, the council's got the incentives for those development contributions to be as high as POS because they get the dough. The developer doesn't want to pay a bean. Uh, and so what we are doing with that legislation is providing a development contribution commissioner who will be an independent party to be able to resolve those disputes and get some real tension in there to get those costs down. And the further part of that legislation is making it easier for developers to actually be participants in providing some of the infrastructure, whether it be water and other, that's associated with those developments. There is some of that going on, but we think there's a lot more potential to get smarter in that space. Now, the third area of work coming from the Productivity Commission report uh, is in the work that we're doing around materials. And I'm going to cover this in a bit more interest because I know uh, there is a large number of players in this room uh, who are in that space and want to know what the government's agenda is. Uh, our view is that New Zealand consumers are, are paying too much for their building materials costs, that our systems are not working as effectively as they should be, and some reform is required uh, to improve it. Now, this is a very complicated area, and that is because while you're concerned with cost, you equally need to be concerned with quality. And if there's any part of the government's housing affordability work program, this is probably the most complex and the most challenging because it includes a whole lot of subcomponents. Now, the first, we need to be honest that the New Zealand market is quite a small market in terms of manufacturing and supply of building materials. And for that reason, the policies that the government has about imports becomes quite important in terms of keeping the Kiwi system honest. So it's not that the government is not strongly supportive of New Zealand industry providing as much of the building products that we're going to need for the big house building program in Way in Auckland and the rebuild in Christchurch, but it is our view that we need to compete the competitive uh, forces as strong as possible uh, so that New Zealand Incorporated uh, gets the benefit of that. And that is why we're reviewing uh, both the tariffs and looking at concessions in that space, as is set out in that options paper, and also looking at the anti-dumping duties and the role that they have played in terms of the price that Kiwis are paying for products like plasterboard which stick out quite significantly as an area where New Zealanders are paying a lot more than what is apparent in Australia uh, and some other markets. The second thing that concerns us, and this is a bit complex, but let me work your way through it. The government is doing a major piece of reform around Standards New Zealand. <coughs> let me tell you what the problem is. Back at the sort of high tide of rod genomics, uh, in 1987, the government removed all funding from Standards New Zealand and says, stand on your own two damn feet. In theory, sounded great. In practice, it's created a number of problems. The first is that, as an engineer, first thing you did when you worked out of engineering school is you whipped down to the bookshop at the university and you bought a copy of every one of the standards. I remember paying for mine. I've still got the price tag on it. I think it was $2.10 uh, for the standard framing uh, design standard. Because Standards New Zealand has no public funding, they have had to push those costs through the roof, 
the biggest joke I've seen as Minister of Housing was going to an apprenticeship award. And the top apprentice in Nelson got a copy of 3604 as his prize. <laughs> you know? I'm sorry. Actually, the free dissemination of standards information is really important if we are to get a more efficient industry, and that's why the governments are been reviewing that. The second thing that's happened as a consequence of Standards New Zealand is it's really important for a country, and remember about 70% of the work of Standards New Zealand is in the building space, is that they've been starved of the resources to be able to review those standards in an appropriate and efficient way which is actually holding back some of the innovation that we need to occur in the building industry. And where previously we think we had been and could proudly say that we were world leaders, in our view that system uh, needs revision. And there's a third very important area, and that is if you truly are to have a standard system that is about protecting the quality rather than the commercial interest of making sure I don't face competition, for my part of the building envelope or structure, then we need to make sure that there is a greater degree of independence around those standard setting committees. Because in reality, Standards New Zealand is broke, financially starved. As a consequence, there's been too little of the independent view being expressed in the development of those standards. And I don't criticise businesses. Businesses will do what businesses do, and that's look after their interests. And in my view, through that standards process, uh, we need to get a bit more accountability and one of the options that we have as part of that review of Standards New Zealand is actually providing part of that building levy that comes through the system to provide a public good function and as a consequence to then provide, hopefully through uh, the internet today, because actually the days of printed standards is very much old fashioned, and making that standards material better quality, better researched and more freely available. Now the other part uh, of that regulatory uh, requirement is the bureaucratic inertia around bringing new products to market. And again, there are some questions for government that we've posed in the options paper around the governance of brands. Now, you guys are some of these people, but let me be blunt with you. The levy that's charged on people's building permits is a levy on consumers, paid by consumers, yet controlled by industry. And that is why the government is saying, and looking to the future of brands, that we actually need to get a bit more of a consumer voice into the machinery of brands uh, to ensure that it is genuinely about driving building innovation rather than it being a protection of the sort of status quo uh, of the building industry. The third part that's a bit edgy, I'll take you into a different sector so you get a feel of what I'm on about. All of you will have seen the financial mess and the collapse of finance companies and what occurred within that industry. Now, one of the things that the government has done in that sector is that there was a real problem of incentive payments for your financial advisor to say, please buy product A, it's a really good one. Unbeknown to you, the provider of financial product A is getting a cut on your investment in it. And the government says, what's the best way to deal with these issues? Sunlight is the best disinfectant. And so in the financial regulations, we require financial advisors today to disclose any of those provisions that are operating so that when the financial advisor recommends a product, you know he's doing it because he thinks it's the best product, not because he's getting some financial incentive. And equally so, our view is in the building materials market. I've seen sufficient evidence of some of the supply contracts that in my view are not disclosed, that distort the incentives, and that the industry requires a greater degree of disclosure if we are to get the genuine competition that we require in terms of building materials. So there are some of the options that we're working in that field. I do want to cover the two other areas, and that is in terms of the productivity of our broader building sector. We've got a real problem in New Zealand in that just the nature of the way in which our building industry has evolved is that we have lots of small bespoke builders. And if we really are to improve the affordability of housing, the government needs to work with the industry to support the growth of scale, to support the growth of a greater degree of manufacture and uh, improvement in efficiency uh, to get those productivity gains. And my colleague, Morris Williamson, is leading in that area. To a large degree, 
that has to be led by industry. But there are some things the government can do in partnership with the sort of delivery end of the building trade to improve the efficiency of that, and one of the important ones in that productivity is the investment that the government makes in skills. And so, for instance, you've seen our government really ramping up the number of apprentices in skills training, particularly in your industry, uh, because that is absolutely pivotal if we're going to get a better degree of productivity. Then the last area uh, is the issue around compliance costs. And again, if we look at those international comparisons, we've got a real challenge in that building consenting system uh, to be able to get that system to work more efficiently with less costs. Pivotal to cracking that is going to be working through the complex issues around liability. And that's why we've got the Law Commission doing a substantive piece of work around it. I've got some sympathy for local authorities in that you have a whole lot of players producing a house together and never by any deliberate intent of Parliament, if anything goes wrong, the first people to get sued is the council, who are probably getting 2 to 3% of the value of the building. And that has partly come about uh, by the fact that the council's got deep pockets. It's partly come about by the way in which the building industry has structured itself, and I'm particularly concerned about the high rate of turnover of our building companies uh, that reinforces a culture. And you can't blame the council for then becoming incredibly pedantic and cautious in granting building permits when they have the potential to literally get whacked with billions of dollars of liability. And that's why those two parts come together. Uh, the other part that my colleague Morris Williamson is advancing is a new online building consenting system. The amount of paper that's involved in that industry is prehistoric. And just as the government is working through another portfolio and moving to an internet-based system, so too we need to do, and in fact working with the Auckland Council on the development uh, of a internet's building consent system. Uh, last point I'd want to make is that I've given quite a lot of talk about the government's uh, work program around improving the affordability uh, of housing. Take note also of the significant reforms the government's bringing in that social housing space. Uh, that is, we just passed the bill through Parliament last week. For 75 years, the assumption has been the only people that can provide housing for our most needy citizens is the state. And the game changer in last week's reform, I'll just quickly explain it to you, the government writes a cheque out each year for Housing New Zealand for about $700 million a year to pay for the difference between the fair market rent for a property and the affordable income related rent that that poorer household is able to afford. What we've done with that reform is open up that $700 million subsidy to a whole range, and there's about 35 at the moment, expect this pace to grow, of community housing providers. Now, if you're the Salvation Army or your Nadi Fatua uh, or your Habitat for Humanity, you can understand that providing housing for our most needy citizens ain't a great investment because the rent that you inevitably receive is a small fraction of the true and fair market value. But if the government's prepared to pay that difference on the same basis as housing New Zealand, you're going to see a big growth, and that's already starting to get some momentum in that social housing sector. And I invite some of the players here in the building industry to make sure you're connected with that big growth. Uh, we're expecting literally thousands of homes to be built in the government's partnership with that sector as we move forward, and we want you players involved. Thank you again for the invitation, and welcome answering any questions that you may have. Uh, together, my view is uh, I feel incredibly optimistic about your industry uh, and about the growth prospects both in this city and uh, in Christchurch with the rebuild, uh, and look forward to working with you to make sure that we can get the more affordable quality houses that New Zealand needs. Thank you very much.